Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Brent Peterson, and uh, this is Charlie Hunt. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for coming this afternoon. We're going to give a presentation on uh, B2B. And um, uh, getting cozy with B2B, we asked for a bed to be up here and sit in the bed, but they wouldn't accommodate us, so they gave us these two chairs. And so we're going to uh, give a walkthrough of the, of the uh, soak and sleep way for B2B. Um, <clears throat> first off, who's, who's already on B2B or who, who has a B2B business here? And who's using Magento for that B2B business? Great. And are you using the new Magento module or the Magento B2B function? Or are you using Magento in general for B2B? Who, who's using the Magento module right now? All right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, do, do you want to start using the B2B module? Is that, is that your interest here? Yes. Yeah? Great. Well, we can perhaps share a few stories with you on the highs and lows of that. Yeah, so we're going to kind of walk through this, what Soak and Sleep went through from B to C to B to B. We're going to tell you about the opportunities uh, that they saw, um, a few things that went right. We're going to, Charlie's going to share some things that went wrong. Um, we're going to have some really good facts, real facts, not fake facts, but real facts. And uh, we're going to give you a little bit, of, a little bit about the future of, of Charlie's business and, and some future. What does B two B look like in the future? Um, so first, you know, I, I be, the online B two B is um, a great opportunity for any any retailer, e commerce retailer, uh, because it's making the tools so simple. The projected the projected total global market for B2B uh, in 2020 is going to be $6.7 trillion, which will be twice the size of the B2C market. Forrester's is, uh, has also said the U.S. B2B market is going to be twice the size of the B2C market in, by 2020. Uh, so for the soak and sleep way, um, Charlie, tell us a little bit about your customer. I know that you, you've had the same sales, basically, a new channel. So what is it? tell us a little bit about your B2B customer. Yeah, so we uh, saw those same stats that saw this incredible explosion of B2B trading that is happening right now. And what was stunning about that was that the growth of B2B is going at a pace that was far, far quicker than the B2C growth. So, we, we, those stats showed us that it took around 20 years to get around three trillion pounds worth of, of, of B2C sales in the world. B2B sales will be double that in half the time. So anyone who's on B2C platforms who have proprietary products, this is a fantastic opportunity to get in on. And uh, so what we've seen over the last uh, three, four years is our customers who buy for hotels, for buy for uh, holiday homes, buy for schools, prisons, and so on, are coming to a B2C provider to see whether they can get the value that perhaps a traditional B2B provider doesn't give. And we've seen, uh, we've seen that over the last few years, and uh, we're now reacting to that uh, alongside with the Magento developments to try and harness the, the opportunity that's there. So your top 100 customer, their behavior is changing. Would you, would you say the top 100 customer that you have is, is the same in B2C or different in B2B? So completely different. We've, 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 we've got a very clear profile of our B2B customers. And what we're seeing is that those B2B customers are really desperate to transact online. They want to have all the benefits of the B2C work that we all work out and, and have developed over the last few years in improving the UX, improving the frictionless checkout and so on. And our, our B2B customers want that same sort of experience for their purchasing. Um, so o over the last uh, two or three years, we've seen going from no B2B customers ordering online to then them starting buying through our B2C site. And now um, we expect over the next six months, over half of our top 100 customers to be transacting on our B2B, B2C site. So there's a big shift in behavior happening right now on the B2B buying. 
I know I, I was looking for some uh, pillows, and you gave me a great deal on 100 pillows from the B2B <laughs> side. I wish. I just don't know what my wife is going to say when, when you deliver them all. Uh, so, which leads right into international. Uh, we're in the U.S., uh, you're in England. Uh, the whole market has changed, and the delivery methods have changed. Can you tell us a little bit about how it's changing in the shipping world and how, how that's affecting your B2B sure, business? Sure, So uh, not only is the demand changing, but we're seeing from an operational side the, uh, the, the opportunities is growing as technology is enabling us to offer more people on a wider market our product. So uh, the big thing for us is the cross, cross-border international development. And what we can now do in the UK, and if you're not in the UK but in the US, or it's the same around the world, is that you'll find that delivery to these other markets is a lot easier than it used to be, a lot more efficient than it used to be. So therefore, we're now selling into uh, super yachts in the south of France because the product we have in the UK can be delivered out to the south of France at a very efficient way. So when we look at B2B, we're not looking at our local market, we're looking at the global market and looking at how the, the cost of transportation is lowering and enabling us to get into those, those other markets. What, one interesting stat we have is that we can now deliver to anywhere in Australia from the UK for £14. So for £14, we, we send product to a, to a jumbo in the, in, in the Midlands and it goes over to Sydney and then gets delivered out into to Australia. So that, that opportunity, along with the the consumer behavior change is really opening up something for us all to, to look forward to. And just kind of give us a little idea about the financial part of that for, for all that. So B2B. one of the hindrances we found was that we, we were set up as a B2C business, so we are used to using the normal checkout uh, methods where normally you pay at checkout and then you deliver two or three days later along those lines. What the B2B customers want is to have credit. They always will want 30 days or if not 45 or 60 days in our market. We weren't set up for that and so we found that having to create a whole infrastructure within our business to, within the finance team to offer the credit was adding costs that we didn't want to do. What we're now seeing is that the, the checkout providers in the B2C world um, who offer deferred settlement, and you, you would have seen some of the guys here, like PayPal Credit and so on, they're now bringing online B2B opportunities whereby the B2B customer can also get the same benefits of the B2C transactional benefits. And that therefore means that a B2C business can now really trade properly like a B2B business in the same way as, as, as they would have in the old days. Yeah, and we're not going to go into all the details of, of the different parts of the Magento B2B, but there is a hierarchy now as part of the Magento uh, B2B module that allows for a, an approval in a buying flow. And so if, a, if, if there's credit terms available, you also don't have to worry about somebody ordering 100 duvet color, covers for their 12-foot sailboat or something like that. Um, Absolutely. And uh, it, it allows for a better workflow within the B2B environment. And, and, and the great thing is, those who have already done that, you as a B2C uh, business, you get paid up front. So you're giving the business th what they need, and you as a B2C business are getting what you need as well. So both sides win on that, that scenario. All right, so we, we talked about the soak and sleep way. Um, let's talk about um, a USP. And I, what is a USP? I have no idea. What, what, what does that even mean? So Brent didn't know what USP was. Did, is this a terminology that is just to me, or does everyone know what USP means? Yeah? Is it just Brent? It's me. Yeah. <laughs> <That's>, okay. <laughs> These are techies for you. So um, I, don't, I had to explain <laughs> this to Brent earlier, but uh, our USP unique selling point is uh, it, it, when you're going into the B2B side, and it's the same in the B2C side, but you've got to be very, very clear on what your offering is. Uh, a product like ours is relatively generic, commoditized product. So you've got to stand out from the competition. And part of the, the, the communication piece that we had to do was uh, the relationship is sort of much more personal. So we couldn't get the, 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 uh, the content on the site to, to, to 
to shout about the USP points, and we had to really train our staff internally to understand what the, the key USPs were so that the, the B2B customers knew what we were about. So my, my unique selling point would be a free jar of Marmite with every pillow that I order. That'd be a would good it? one. Good, yeah. good. Thank you. <laughs> um, so tell us about how, that process and how you expanded into B2B. So uh, the, the, the initial start was, uh, as I touched on earlier, was that the B2B customers were ordering on our site, but then calling up and saying, I've ordered 200 duvets or 100 pillows. Can you please create a special delivery to this hotel or that hotel? And that's when we, very in the early days, the three or four years ago, were discovering that, that there was a demand out there for B2B. Um, that then evolved into us then creating a B2B team within the B2C setup, whereby we had dedicated account managers for our B2B customers. We, we, we found that the B2B customers want that personal touch. They need to have someone who they can call, particularly at the start of the journey with the relationship. So what we have developed is that our, our, our B2B team all have their own account uh, account people that they look after, account customers they look after, and they create that personal relationship. But then what we're seeing is that once that relationship's created through telephone, then it moves online for the order processing and so on. And how about some advantages that B2B would have over uh, straight B2C? Well, uh, th those of you who are looking to do it, obviously, buying bulk, you get better pricing. So those who are coming to us and saying they want to buy you know, two, three, four hundred duvets at a time can command a better buying price than, than, than those who are buying single units and so on. So the B2B side would expect to have a better price, but not hugely. What they're looking for, we find, is the great service that B2C has been set up to do. They want next day delivery on 100 duvets, 200 duvets, whereas the traditional B2B sector was all about um, placing your order and then waiting maybe a month for that delivery to come. So the B2B guys want to have the B2C service levels, but they, but, and that's what's really driving them to a business like us. So it's a real melting between the two, yeah. giving yeah. them all the advantages of B2B while giving them the advantages of B2C. Yeah. yeah. Good. All right, so let's just kind of briefly go uh, about how Magento has fit in. I know that you, you originally started on Magento 1, and so you started before there was any, even any hinkling of a B2B module, um, and then you went to, B2, B2, uh, you went to Magento 2. Uh, just uh, how, how, does, how does Magento fit in for you? Okay, well, Magento's had B2B for about a year, I think, mm -hmm. about a year ago. And so uh, it, it, over the last year is where it's become a hot, a hot topic. And uh, some of you may have seen Amazon have gone into B2B in a big way recently. And that one of the slides earlier showed the growth that, that they're having. Um, before Magento went into B2B, really there wasn't any option for B2B development on our site unless it was bespoke, bespoke work by our SI. And we learned with Magento 1 that we don't want to go down bespoke development unless we can possibly avoid it. So we really needed Magento to get onto the, onto the B2B development so that it can, it can grow with the demand in the, in the global market for B2B commerce. Um, so Magento 1 had nothing. Um, Magento 2, up until last year, had nothing. But in the last year, we saw, I think it was September a year ago, uh, that mm -hmm. the first phase of B2B was launched on, on Magento, and that provided the key functionality for some basic B2B trading. But we heard this morning in the keynote that there is another whole phase, phase two of B2B being released. So I think Magento are taking this seriously, and I think for, for a small business like ours, that's fantastic, because we will be able to, out of the core code of Magento, be able to grow into this marketplace. Yeah, and I, I, one interesting fact that they're always giving about the B2B versions or for Magento is the community version of Magento originally, or any version of Magento before there was a B2B, it was still the largest uh, commerce platform for B2B even before B2B existed in Magento. And I just said a lot of B2Bs there, so sorry about that. Um, Charlie, <laughs> tell us, uh, so like, can you 
give us just, uh, you had an uh, interesting journey in how you, wet, how you met Wagento. Well, this is a plug for you guys, which, <laughs> which is fine. So, so Wagento is a, an American uh, business. Um, what we were looking for uh, in, in finding our SI was uh, a company that could output development at, at a rapid pace in a cost-effective way. And uh, uh, Brent has got a business, uh, he's, a, he's a Magento master out of the US, but he uses global resources for development. Uh, and so I was looking for a way to unlock the development curve within our business by going global to find more cost-effective implementations. Uh, Brent was at the time in India, and I, I was Googling around looking for options, found him at a conference in India. We spoke on WhatsApp. And then within a week, I was on a plane to America, met you, and then to India to meet your team in India. And that was six months ago. So uh, cost shouldn't be a barrier to your development in B2B. I would, I would strongly look, look out there, find cost-effective ways, because Brent and his team develop, I think, top-notch uh, code. And we've had no problems, and you know, I would thoroughly recommend that. Is that a good enough yep. plug? Thank you very much. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right. Um, uh, let's uh, let's just um, let's let's talk about some challenges that you've had in B two B versus B two C. Um, if you could just briefly go over some of the tech challenges that you've had, finance, know how. Uh, I know those are all going to be uh, relevant to everybody here. Sure. So tech is a is a really interesting point because again, coming out of B two C into B two B, the whole business is built around the UX of the B two C site and built around the 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 user journey on the B two B in the B two C site. So I was finding that through all the development meetings that we're having, we're always focusing on the B two C side, but actually when we look at the numbers, B2B is where the big opportunity is. So that there has to be a, a mindset change within the business to make sure that B2B isn't an afterthought in all of the, the meetings that one has. And you know, still today, we struggle with that a bit because we'll go through our trading packs and look at you know, the sales every week, and then we'll eventually get to, and how did B2B do? What will happen, I suspect, is that B2B will, will come up and overtake B2C or at least give it a real challenge. So, so from a tech point of view, all of our tech guys will focus on the B2C side, but not looking at the B2B side. So our B2B offering was pretty poor, frankly. We, we got the business because we had a USP proposition that people loved the product and so on and got the, the price right. But actually, as an experience, it was pretty terrible. Um, and it's not until the last few months that we've started to unlock some of the Magento uh, functionality for B2B that we're beginning to see so a better experience there. And what's interesting is as soon as we turn on any of the functionality that Magento have, we see an adoption of that. So there is a pent up demand within the market for B2B commerce. Um, and I'm delighted that, as I said earlier, that Magento have announced this morning another role of that with B2B2 coming, coming through probably in the next year or so, because I think that this is all potential that is, that is going to be unlocked for all of us. Yeah, um, so the B2B2. Yeah, that, if you remember <laughs> that's that. the one. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, in your staff, have they fully embraced this? What do you mean by that? How, how, <laughs> that's, that's a techie question. Yeah. Um, how, how, does your, how does your staff feel about now going more online and, and giving and maybe having less interaction with, with the client eventually? Yeah, I think uh, you know, anyone in commerce will, will enjoy getting people online more. It's, it's where you know, we don't want to go backwards to where it's a manual, a manual intensive business model. So I think the more people move online, that, that's great. But it is a different mindset. The skill sets with the, with the teams, you know, we've got a very small team, um, uh, you know, is very different from the B2C side. So we are having to learn as we go along to, to get it right. Okay, good. So do you want to talk about things that went wrong or should we skip yeah, through this whole yeah, thing? Yeah, let's go. All right. So uh, I, we, we picked five things and um, Charlie was very gracious and in, in sharing some, some things like this. So the uh, product profile, the B2B product profile, tell us a little bit about that. So this 
for our businesses it was an absolute nightmare. Uh, because what would happen is that we, we sell around 2,000 SKUs. The B2B side, they probably only look at around 100 SKUs. They pretty well want the same sort of thing in a boutique hotel, um, and they all have a similar sort of requirement there. But what they'll do is they'll come in and order a significant volume of a single item, and we would sell that to that hotel or, or school or, or, or whatever. But then what that does is that strips out all of that stock availability to our B2C side of the business. As a result, our B2C side of the business then suffers and we have stock outs and service levels go down. And then we get complaints from our consumer side because we don't have stock availability. So in the early days, what we're finding was that to get the right stock availability was absolutely critical to service the two different demands. And what we've ended up doing is, is ring fencing the B2B stock and, and not allowing the B2B guys to nick the B2C stock holding. Otherwise, you damage your main business. Um, so that was a, a difficult learning curve. And it takes time as we manufacture our own product just to replenish. It can be a six month lead time. So it is something that was really painful in the early days and where we would sell to a hotel, then couldn't resell to them when they come back to us, or we'd sell to a hotel and then our B2C customers wouldn't have any stock for six months. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a challenge, and it's something that you know, I would recommend anyone who's going on that journey to look out for. Yeah, I, mean, I can. I, the particular challenge of not having your B2C getting stock for six months would be uh, one of the biggest problems. a big problem, like, yeah. sure. Um, so the mindset of your uh, B2B buyer, or how, what was that? So about? they are uh, much more demanding than the B2C guys. B2C, we all spend all our time fine-tuning our websites to, to, to have fantastic content and getting the conversion through that content. B2B guys, we find in our sector, they want to have the verbal communication. They want to have their hand held to be advised on, on what product to buy because they're going to buy it, uh, A, in big volume, but also in a repeated way. So, so uh, the mindset of the B2B customer is much more demanding. And for that, that means that we have to have the right team within the business to deal with that demand. A customer service uh, person in the B2C side is normally dealing with post-sale issues. A B2B customer service uh, person is dealing about pre-sales normally. Um, so there is a, there's a lot of retraining we have to do in-house to, to, to get that understanding and, and clearly meet the demand of the B2B, B, B2B customer. A lot of B2B. Yeah, customers. too many Bs. <laughs> um, so keeping it simple, and I know my first slide deck here was 175 slides, and you said, Brent, let's just keep it simple, and I, I appreciate the advice. Um, what, what do you mean in the B2B world about keeping it simple? Yeah, so we, we, we try and keep our business simple all the time. And, and you know, my team will always say to, to me, Charlie, you always tell us, you know, you've got to keep it simple, stupid. And that's, you know, our, our kissing is a uh, thing that I love to use within the business. Um, B2B, though, is more complicated. B2B, we will sell significant volume to a single person and they may want to return that and they would expect to want to return that if they've got the wrong type of product or it's been delivered too late or in the wrong way and so on and you have to behave in a way that is very inclusive to that customer um, because what you know is in the long term if you if you nurture that relationship you've got someone who's going to buy from you for years and years and years and if you get it wrong they'll go to your competitor and probably never come back so the way we deal with our b2b customers is is very um, much more engaging much more flexible because we know that long term that the 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 eventual pot of gold at the end of the trail is so, so, so great. Would you say the experience would go from high touch to then the, you're, you're enabling the client to do as much as they want on their own eventually? Yeah, and, and you know, this is, this is the big change, is that they have that initial interaction and then they want to do it themselves. So, so, you know, what we used to find two or three years ago was that we would then raise a purchase order, we would then, you know, set, email them an invoice and all of that sort of stuff. So they don't want that now. What they want to do, they want to have the advice on the product, they want to know what to buy, and then they want to go online and do it in their own time. And they, they want to be able to access 
IT to, to provide that solution. Um, we're not there yet, but we're on that journey, and, but we can feel that, we can see that demand happening now. Um, the other, so the next one is account management, uh, which kind of ties back to, to high touch and keeping it simple. Yeah, we, we, we just didn't get it right. We, we treated our B2B customers like B2C customers. So they'll call into our B2C guys and be incredibly demanding to our B2C guys, and they just didn't get it. And we didn't get it because, you know, it's just a completely different demand. So what we've done is we've split our customer service teams out so they're totally different teams now within the business, which is a shame in a way because you, you lose efficiency there. But the, the demand from B2B is just so much greater at the early stages than the B2C guys. And then finally, um, if, if you were to plan all this in advance, then you probably wouldn't have any of these problems. So planning... Well, that's it. I mean, you know, we would only ever look at B2B as a last breath of the day in our, in our sort of working within the business. And that meant that, you know, in the early days, we neglected all the B2B uh, requirements. We weren't focused on the opportunity. Um, we weren't looking after our customers properly. So you've got to build that infrastructure so that the B2B guys who come to you are looked after properly. And, that, you know, in the early days, we found that really hard to do. Okay. All right, so we, we are going to have some killer facts, so to speak. And uh, the first, uh, uh, this slide is just represents just sales on B2B. So this is set aside from Charlie's uh, B2C business. And you can see that from year one to year four, uh, it's gone up uh, a lot. I did the math on year, to year five, so I don't have the stat in my head between then. But at the end, we've got a 3,000% uh, increase in, that, in just the B2B side of the business, which is going to eventually represent probably double the size of your B2B or B2C business. Well, if, if the slide at the start that the, the guys are predicting is true, that's going to be the case. I don't know where it's going to take us, but we are seeing exponential growth in that B2B side. And then what's, what's really interesting with this slide is that where the, the commerce started to kick in is where we've seen the growth. So 17 to 19 is where Magento Commerce started doing B2B, and that is where we're seeing the growth come through. Um, so, you know, it's, I think it's a really exciting opportunity there. Yeah, and I think a lot of, uh, a lot of um, if, if you're a pure B2B client, you may, not, you may not have, you wouldn't see this, but as a B2C client moving to B2B, this is where the real opportunities present themselves. Um, so, um, I, I know some of this is, has helped Soak and Sleep being the number one duvet and pillow retailer in the UK. Pure play. Pure play, Online. sorry. Yes, pure play. Um, and w w tell us, what does that mean? Well, apparently, that means that we now, I, I don't know if you guys have heard of those, you're not English here, but Wembley Stadium. We can now fill Wembley Stadium full of duvets every year with the volume of duvets we're selling. So that's pretty exciting to us, and we see B2B as a big, big opportunity there to, to grow those units that we're selling. Where do people, where do they sit then? We do Sorry. it on weekdays. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I did tell Charlie that I'm going to throw some jokes in, and he's not going to know when they're going to happen. So if you see him just <laughs> freeze, it's because I didn't tell him what was going to come next. Sorry. OK, so and you've also won awards, right? So the uh, best duvet and pillow retailer in the UK two years in a row. Yeah, we're, we're really proud of that. And it's down to that USP thing. You know, which magazine for the Brits is the, the independent assessor of product? And that's really helped our B2B side because people get the trust marks and an and independent verification of the quality of the product. And for the last two years, uh, which has, has very luckily for us awarded us the best duvet and pillow retailer in the UK. So that's great for B2B sales. Yeah, and I think the, the interesting part of this is that there are some really big players in the industry and you're beating them at their own game. At the moment. Yes. <laughs> if we have stock. <laughs> if you have stock, yeah. Um, if I haven't bought them all. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. Okay, so the, what, what does this look like uh, for your future? Um, dedicated wholesale. I, I know we had talked, what we, we didn't talk about yet was you're going to split out your site into a dedicated B2B site and a de dedicated B2C site. Um, and uh, we're helping you do that right now. And that'll give you some more 
flexibility uh, around making more maybe dramatic changes to your B2B side so it doesn't yeah. affect the B2C side and you can also do some testing on both uh, when you segmented it that a little harder and you can also firewall your entire B2B side uh, which would then not affect perhaps if you have something that you don't want to be an SEO or something like that. Yeah, and it's, it's a, we've recently taken a decision to fully go the whole way and separate the sites out. So by the end of this year, we hope to launch our dedicated B2B site, which I think, Brent, just sits on the Magento platform. Mm -hmm. Is that right? It'll and be done next week. It'll be done next week. Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I think that's an important, important step in the development of B2B. Again, you know, does that duplicate the cost and resources within the business? I don't know, but it's, you, I feel you've just got to do it because that's where the demand is coming from. So if you then have a dedicated B2B site that isn't a compromise, I think that will really help. Yeah, and not to go into a lot of technical bits, but Magento does have the ability to run out of the same instance, so you don't have to have a new instance of Magento. And we can actually use the same theme in the beginning, and we can inherit a lot of the B2C functions, but then start making changes to that B2B side without affecting the B2C side. Okay, so the next one is a self-service account. So that is that just like the self-service checkouts? Yeah, like I think... Like Tesco? I, so, so, well, not quite like that. Um, I think what... Uh, we do now is we've turned on some of the B2B functions on our site, but we can't turn them all on um, until we have a dedicated uh, B2B site. So by moving into this new dedicated site, we'll be able to turn on all of the functionality that, that Magento offer. And you know, I can't wait to do that because, every, as I said earlier, every time we turn on a function within the, the Magento ecosystem, we just see the pickup of demand there. So, uh, you know, the sooner we can turn on the functionality, the functionality, the better. We'll do it tomorrow. Thank you, Ren. Okay, so uh, <laughs> credit, you're gonna uh, full credit facilities? Yeah, so again, we touched on that. That's coming through fairly soon to be able to give this, this credit without you as a business having to provide the credit is a really important step, I think, in, in, in meeting the B2B demand. And I've, I've had discussions here with the guys, the finance institutions that, that are in the marketplace. They're all bringing it online, available to us over the next few months. So I think that's really exciting. In this next one, I see you're going to start selling dog whistles. I wasn't sure how that fit into the pillows. So again, Brent probably doesn't get this. Does, it, does, does anyone know the terminology dog whistling? No? So dog whistling is if you blow a whistle, a dog whistle, humans can't hear that whistle, but the dog can. And, and we use that as an expression to, to target Pacific markets. So we, we want in the B2B side have landing pages that is applicable to very specific narrow markets, but really capture those opportunities. So for us in our, in our sector, um, it is about um, focusing in on things like sh ski chalets in the Alps or yachts in the Mediterranean. And I, I think the, the same approach that the B2C uh, wisdom is now You've got to have relevant content to your customer. So we're looking as our, as our dedicated site to open up those very narrowly focused landing pages and experiences to hit those specific markets. So that's dog whistling. Got it. Thank <laughs> you. And then uh, ramping up production. And, and I, we, I guess we didn't even get into the fact that you're making all your own uh, material, all your own products, you're, you're the manufacturer as yeah, well. Our, our challenge is how we man increase, step up the manufacturing side of things to deal with the B2B side. And that's, that's got to come through careful growth of the business. Um, but it's but is exciting if we can get it right. Great. Um, so we have some, we do, we do have some time for some Q&A. And uh, if anybody has any questions for Charlie or myself, we'd be happy to answer sure. as sure. best as we can. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to understand more about um, the way that you deal with uh, your people who are taking credit from you uh, and whether or not there's any uh, method or system for uh, paying off their accounts through the site itself. So is this what you're talking about, paying to when they have the credit is how they settle through the site? Yeah. So from what I understand, the, the banking uh, the checkout solutions will take ownership of the settlement. So, so when they check out, we get paid straight away by the, by the banking uh, supplier, and then they will have the relationship directly with the customer in order to get a settlement for that. So, so, the, so the whole financial uh, 
discipline is taken away from us and it becomes a direct relationship with the checkout provider and our customer. Yeah, so and again, this is, this is pretty popular in the US already that uh, it, would, it would be similar to the, the merchant would get the money right away and the, the contract would be with the vendor of the, the, of the debt. Like a bank. I think Klarna in, in, in Europe is, is, particularly in Scandinavia, is, is growing very rapidly and, and has that model in it. And it appears to be you know, very popular and it's quite an interesting opportunity for us B2B guys. Klarna told me earlier that you know, they haven't got the B2B functionality ready yet, but it's definitely something on their radar and they want to do. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I do a lot of B2B um, clients like you, um, but with people going into digital B2B, a lot of your existing B2B clients, you've got to get over that uh, initial, get them onto online. So a lot of them will still continue to order over the phone using your backend system. So how did you do both as a, a business decision and a, a technological decision to allow those customers to see, say, their whole order processing. So if they ring up and make an order over the phone, how do they get to see that in their history on the website? Have you dealt with that technically and so business-wise? Are you asking how do we persuade our customers to buy online? No, no, what I mean is if, if as, you're, as, you're, as you're doing it, customers have a history of orders with you in the past. It's probably in your back-end systems. They would like to like give them the really good you know, experience on the front end would give them that ability. Do you now put all your new all B2B orders in the back end of Magento? Yes. Or? So, so anyone who is now uh, buying with the B2B module, their orders are held within Magento. So providing they place the order from about six months ago, that, that history is there. Anyone before that, it isn't there. I, I guess it's a, an option of whether you load that up for them in the future, but, but at the moment, we, there are some of our customers just don't want to go online at all, and that's fine with us as well. Um, what we're doing is reacting to the demand, and we're just seeing that change online. So I think it's new customers, 100%, old customers, it's a mix, and the very old ones, none at all, is, is where we are at the moment. What we've seen in, in the same scenario is the, there is typically an ERP that is collecting those orders, and depending on your budget, we can push data into the Magento side. Uh, it could just be as simple as giving them a statement or, a, or even a flat file of what their orders were in the past. Um, or, I mean, I guess I wouldn't recommend putting, you know, a million orders into Magento just so the customers could have some history. Um, but there is a way, there, there's a lot of different ways around giving them their history when it's in your ERP or your dub, whatever, third-party solution you're using for fulfillment. Anyone else? <laughs> right, I think we're there. Wait, we have to have, do the last call for questions. Okay, go. Last call for questions. <laughs> Lights are flashing. Great. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.